Good evening. My name is Stephen Wolfolk. I'm the Director of Programming and Marketing for the Kansas City Public Library. Thank you for joining us as we continue these online installments in our signature event series. This event is co-presented by Rainy Day Books. We hope that now more than ever, you are making an effort to patronize local businesses and Rainy Day Books is one of the best local businesses. If you have questions during the event, you can put those in the comments in the chat box or on the, the uh, comments of the YouTube page and we'll get to as many of those as possible. Now to get things started, I'm gonna hand it off to one of the great friends of the Kansas City Public Library. He served as the moderator for countless programs. He's a regular attendee and last year he was a partner in what turned out to be one of the library's biggest fundraising events ever. He's the co-host of the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast and this event will appear there as a part of the podcast as well. Uh, please welcome Whitney Terrell. Hello. This is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I am Whitney Terrell, the author of the novel, The Good Lieutenant. And I'm Vivi ganesh Chanathan, also known as Sugi, author of the novel, Love Marriage. Sugi, this is going to be the most Kansas City of all Kansas City episodes you've ever had to like deal with on this show. And there've been a lot of those. Uh, yes. we do, we're, doing this, we're doing this episode live in partnership with the Kansas City Public Library. Three cheers for Steve Wolfolk and Carrie Coogan and Vivian Jennings and everyone else from those institutions. And our guest is the fantastic Kansas City born and bred writer, Thomas Frank. And I have just one question for you, Sugi. Have you ever been to Kansas City, the birthplace of populism? I thought populism was born on a train ride between Kansas City and Topeka. That counts. And you're <laughs> avoiding the question. So I have three comments for you. You are welcome in Kansas City because I don't think you've ever been here. I've been to Minneapolis where you live twice since we started this podcast. And three, would you please introduce Tom? It is my great pleasure. Uh, Thomas Frank is the best-selling author of Listen Liberal, Pity the Billionaire, the Wrecking Crew and What's the Matter with Kansas, a former columnist for the Wall Street Journal and Harper's. Frank is the founding editor of The Baffler and writes regularly for The Guardian. Though he was born and raised in Kansas City, he now lives outside Washington, D.C. Tom, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Sugi. It's nice to be here. But, you know, I'm actually in Kansas City at this moment or in the in the suburbs of Kansas City. And I'm <laughs> I am broadcasting to you from the, <laughs> the bedroom I grew up in. This is uh, this is where where we are. That's how we in do it in Kansas City. You know, I used to record the podcast in my childhood bedroom until my parents got an Alexa and then I couldn't use the Wi-Fi anymore. It's pretty, it's pretty, it's a pretty awesome backdrop. And um, I'm sure that for Kansas City folks, it's special to have you. I really am going to have to get to Kansas City, yes. birthplace of populism and so many great people. Um, so your latest book, The People Know, is not just about how populism came to be. The second part of the title is A Brief History of Anti-Populism. And that fascinated me, the separation between what populists thought that populism meant and what we think populism means today, particularly in the media and in the academy. I'm wondering if you could read to us from the opening of the book just to help set the terms. Of that oh, you want to you want me to, to, to do that right now? I was, I was going to say, first of all, the um, before I do that, the... Uh, you know, I, it started out as, as uh, I was just going to write a book about populism, you know, in some, th that was the generic idea. Let's do a book about populism. And as I, the more I studied it, you know, and the way it, the sort of populist sensibility manifested over the decades, which is, that's about half of the book is the way populism has manifested over the years. But what fascinated me was the way populism or these populist moments were defeated or the way people tried to defeat them. Uh, and because there's a, there is a consistency there as well as, so there's a, there's a commonality between populist moments, 1890s, 1930s, 1960s, but there's also a commonality in the people who despised populism and who beat it down. And those, those people are totally in the saddle today. So I, I, yeah, I thought I would start things off by reading from uh by you know doing a doing a little reading from the book and i want you guys if i go too long or if i talk too much or if i say something really stupid would you stop me or would you interject or something like that well tom i've known you long enough to know how to interrupt you and you'll find that uh <laughs> sometimes the, we have we have listeners who write in to complain about how much i interrupt but I, i'll use that ability now okay, <laughs> okay so i'm going to go Give for about permission. about 12 minutes okay all right fire it this up is from the people know the people know. Just a few short years ago, we Americans knew 
what we were doing in the world. We were gonna make the planet into one big likeness of ourselves. We had the experts, we knew how it was done. Our policy operatives would de-radicalize here and regime change there. Our economists would float billions to the good guys and slap sanctions on the bad. Pretty soon the whole world was gonna be stately and neat, safe for debt instruments and empowerment seminars, for hors d'oeuvres in the embassy garden and taxis we hailed with a smartphone. Democracy of thee we sang. Now we stand chastened, humiliated, bewildered, democracy. We tremble to think of what it might do next. Or so, anyways, goes the wail of the American leadership class as they endure another year of panic over where our system is dragging them. The people, they say, are out of control. Populism is the word that comes to the lips of the respectable and the highly educated when they perceive the global system going haywire like this. Populism, for them, is a one-word evocation of the logic of the mob. It is the people as a great rampaging beast. What has happened, the thinkers of Beltway and C-Suite tell us, is that the common folk have declared independence from experts and along the way from reality itself. And so they, the learned, have come together to rescue civilization. Political scientists, journalists, policy advisors, economists, technologists, CEOs, joining as one to save our social order, to save it from populism. This imagined struggle of expert versus populist has a fundamental, almost biblical flavor to it. It is a battle of order against chaos, education against ignorance, mind against appetite, enlightenment against bigotry, culture against barbarism. And from TED Talk and red carpet, the call rings forth. Democracy must be controlled before it ruins our democratic way of life. Now, in attacking populism, the object is not merely to resist Donald Trump, the nation's thinkers say. No, today's political face-off is much bigger than that. It pits the center against the periphery, the consensus against the disgruntled sorehead. And in this conflict, the side of right is supposed to be obvious. Ordinary people are upset, yes, everyone knows this, but the ones whose well-being must concern us most are the elites whom the people threaten to topple. So if the people have lost faith in the ones in charge, it can only be because something has gone wrong with the people themselves. As a writer for The Atlantic put it in the summer of 2016, that horrible summer, our most pressing political problem today is that the country abandoned the establishment, not the other way around. An article in Foreign Policy that same year expressed it more archly. It's time for the elites to rise up against the ignorant masses. Sober citizens worried about populism at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Scholarly types moaned about it at the annual Prague Populism Conference. High net worth individuals reviled it at the World Economic Forum at Davos. The cool kids deplored it at South by Southwest on the plains of Texas. Populism works, these different groups assure us, by putting the common man on a pedestal. It promises him the strong leaders he craves, and then it assaults the intellectuals and the multiculturalism he hates. When populism gets in power, it ignores norms and science. Populism is the ism that stands for mob rule, a headlong collapse into the tyranny of the majority that our founding fathers so dreaded. Now, as you guys know, I am very much in favor of analyzing and understanding and defeating the great right-wing turn of the last 40 years. That's how I have spent my entire adult life. And I think, of course, that it is an entirely legitimate project, something we desperately need to be doing. But why do we have to use the word populism to describe that great right-wing turn? That is the first question that I ask in this book. And the thing is, guys, once upon a time, populism was something real. It was not, you know, a made up political science concept. It was spelled with a capital P and it referred to something specific. 
The word was an American invention. In fact, it was, as Whitney mentioned, invented just a few miles from where I'm sitting right now in Kansas City. And the group that the word referred to, the Populist Party, was one of America's first great economic political uprisings. It was this gigantic mass movement in which millions of ordinary people, people the lowest rank of society, farmers, learned to think of the country's economic system as a thing that they might change by coming together. So populism's great innovation was to make an appeal based on class solidarity. This was a new thing in American politics at the time. Class solidarity, right? Bringing together farmers in the South and the West with factory workers in the Northern cities. The interests of rural and civic labor are the same, proclaimed the uh, Populist Party's famous founding statement. Their enemies our, are, their, excuse me, their enemies are identical, by which the populace meant by enemies is what, by what they meant were people who prospered while making nothing. Bankers, railroad barons, commodity traders, along with their hirelings, corrupt politicians who served wealth instead of the people. Now, the Populist Party died out within a decade. It was our abortive attempt to start a labor party in this country, and it didn't work. But the philosophy that populism embodied did not die. The idea of working people coming together against economic privilege lives on. You might say it constitutes one of the main streams of our democratic tradition. And in this new book of mine, I try to trace the development of that idea over the decades. So anyhow, to summarize, that's the word's historic meaning. And when we use it as a handy term for demagogues and would-be dictators, we are inverting that definition. Populism, in its original formulation, was profoundly democratic. It was a movement that, by the standards of the time, was anti-demagogic. It was pro-enlightenment and pro-science and pro-equality. And in its heyday, and alone among American political parties of the time, populism stood strong for human rights. Populism had prominent women leaders. The populists despised tyrants. They fought against imperialism. Populists defied the poisonous idea of white solidarity. Now, of course, scholars and pundits have a right to ignore all that and you know, blow it off, just dismiss it, and divorce any word they choose from its original meaning. You are allowed to do that. It is legitimate to define the word populist just however they please. But here's the second question I ask in this book. Why would you do that? Why would someone use such a fine democratic word to mean racist, to mean dictator, to mean anti-intellectual? And the answer, is that denunciations of populism like the ones that we hear from all sides nowadays are part of a long tradition of pessimism about popular sovereignty and democratic participation. And the name I give to the pes this, this pessimistic tradition that I'm describing is anti-populism. And it has a history too. It is amazingly consistent across the decades. And when you investigate the history of anti-populism, you find it using the same rhetoric over and over again, whether it's defending the gold standard in 1896 or NAFTA in 2016, anti-populism mobilizes the same sentiments and draws the same ugly stereotypes. It sometimes even speaks to us from the very same prestigious institutions. Its most toxic ingredient, a sort of highbrow contempt for ordinary Americans, is as poisonous today as it was in the Victorian era or the 1930s. <clears throat> now, modern day thinkers who attack what they call populism only rarely bother to consider the movement that invented the word, the people here in Kansas City who came up with the word populist. What they usually do is apply the term to European politicians like the Le Pen family or you know, South American demagogues. Some of these experts, I read a whole bunch of their books and articles, some of them seem unaware that the populist party of the 1890s even existed. But what these present day thinkers, you know, they can deny that, they can ignore that, whatever, but they cannot escape the roots of their own anti-populist tradition. Whether or not they've ever heard of people like sockless Jerry Simpson, who is a congressman from Kansas, 
when they denounce populism, they are embracing a political tradition that originally sprang up to stop radicals like him. Now, I want to go back to the middle of the 1890s. Okay, let's just uh, get a picture of what the world looked like. Uh, there was a depression in full effect. Uh, uh, economic discontent was everywhere. There were huge strikes, big strike, uh, national railroad strike, uh, you know, centered in Pullman. There was a march on Washington, the first ever march on Washington, uh, for that matter. Uh, everybody thought the class war was coming. The class war was at hand. And then in 1896, the Democratic Party gets together for its annual, for its uh, convention. They toss overboard the incumbent Democratic president, uh, Grover Cleveland, and nominate instead this guy, William Jennings Bryan, 36 years old, a currency reformer from Nebraska who has this uh, incredible oratorical gift. And then a few weeks later, the Populist Party meets at their convention and endorses him as well. Okay, among the respectable, these two events were the trigger for absolute hysteria. To the establishment, there was no doubt about what William Jennings Bryan signified. One of the nation's main political parties had been captured by radicalism, and the shock was as great as a stock market crash. Now, as you and I know, Bryan was not really a radical, but his threat to the establishment was not imaginary. His plan for taking the country off the gold standard would have seriously threatened uh, financial interests. And so here it comes, hysteria. Our system was coming unraveled, the respectables yelled, with society's worst elements lining up against its best. And so the class war now began in earnest, only from the top down. Among the establishment consensus rule, this sort of ironclad consensus. Journalists, academics, clergymen, millionaires, bankers, businessmen of every description, they all came together with the Republican Party to stave off the challenge posed by Brian. And the word they used to summarize their hatred and their fear was the same one we use today, populism. So in this book of mine, I give the details of the establishment's incredible assault on Brian, the means by which they put him down. And a lot of it is, um, it's, it's spectacular. And we're, I guess we're gonna look at some of the illustrations from it later on, some of the political cartoons from that era. But it included all of the usual 19th century, you know, electoral skullduggery. But above all, it was about building a stereotype of this thing they called populism. Populism, these long ago reactionaries said, Populism is mob rule. Populism is anarchy. Populism is a willful refusal to listen to the experts. Populism is a kind of mental illness. Populism is a bid for dictatorship. But above all, populism represents rule by a class of people who cannot be permitted to rule. I'm going to give one example and then we'll wind this up. It's, it's a pamphlet written by, well, this is a, the perfect podcast for it, written by a great man of letters, John Hay, a novelist, wrote all sorts of stuff in the uh, 19th century, forgotten today, but was very famous at the time. The pamphlet was distributed all over the country by the Republican Party. The title of Hay's pamphlet was The Platform of Anarchy, and it defames populism in precisely the way our modern pundits and political scientists today defame populism. Populists, John Hay wrote, valued nothing, throwing their frantic challenge against every feature of our civilization. They appealed to the openly lawless. They waged a shameful insurrection against law and national honesty. For the plumed knights of the Republican Party it is as if a champion at a tourney awaiting the onset of a chivalrous antagonist should suddenly find himself attacked by a lunatic in rags. So everywhere you look that year, the respectable were facing off against the contemptible. Quality and good taste were menaced by the rabble for no reason greater than the supposed resentment of lower animals for higher ones. And this stereotype endures. It goes on today. Populism itself, as I said, has largely been forgotten. But the anti-populist backlash of the 1890s is still with us today. Indeed, it has become a form of respectable scholarly practice. 
And what the elites said then, the elites say today as well. We absorb the message now from TED Talks and social media, but anti-populism itself is a living fossil, a 19th century smear campaign that is somehow still going. So my object in this book is both to understand that long running form of conservative reaction and also to rescue from it our American radical tradition, the one form of politics, I think, that has a chance, a real chance of undoing this nation's long right wing turn. That's the book, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I, yeah. <laughs> You got I, it. I mean, a lot of contemporary commentators associate populism with, as you were pointing out in there, <sighs> racist and, and anti-immigrant ideology and language. And this is one of the reasons people call Trump a populist, right? But you're saying that that's historically inaccurate. And I wanted you, if you could sort of, you, you write a, quite a bit about this in the book, and obviously the populists are not perfect on this issue, but yeah. I wanted you to talk about well, that I'm issue almost, almost no one was in the, in the 1890s. But it's important to remember about, and, and, and by the way, that is my, my caveat. They, they were not perfect. Uh, a lot of them were racists, but at the same time, a lot of them were what uh, would have passed for anti-racism at the time. They, uh, there were a lot of, like, here in Kansas, for example, uh, you know, Kansas was founded by abolitionists and a lot of these abolitionists were still around in the 1890s and uh, thought that populism was the next step in, in social progress. And they signed up for the populist movement. In fact, um, I recently found out the man who wrote the 13th Amendment, the one abolishing slavery, um, he was a senator from Illinois. He went into retirement, but then he came back out to sign up with populism and give speeches on behalf of populism in the 1890s. You know, didn't end well, but another important thing to remember is that the real racist um, power in the 1890s was the Democratic Party in the South. Uh, they, they were this, you know, monolithic. The South was a one party system. Uh, and, you know, that party was the Democrats and the Democrats enforced their rule by uh, this kind of incredible uh, racist propaganda. You know, this was the uh, this is the, you know, the Jim Crow system. And, that and they sort of, of went after the populace in North. Yeah, Carolina, that was the, that right? was the great they... enemy. That was that was the great enemy of populism in the South. So populism had two regions where it was strong. One was here in the Kansas and the Midwest. The other was in the South. And uh, in the South, that was what they had to do. They had to fight the Democratic Party. And the way they did it uh, was by reaching out to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, black farmers. The whole idea was, uh, well, the whole idea, this was one of, their, uh, I, one of their ideas was that the interests of poor black farmers and poor white farmers were largely the same. And if they came together, they could, you know, came together politically, they could advance their, you know, they could improve their situation. And you got to also remember there was a, there was a group called the Black Populists. Uh, this is these people are never mentioned whenever when someone is is talking about how racist populism was. There was this uh, there was a whole contingent of Black Populists, and they were not insignificant. They provided a lot of votes uh, for populist candidates in the Southern states. So we're going to talk more about the this idea of a joining <clears throat> working class white and black. Uh, members of the working class. Okay, but, the but there's one. There's one really important thing. Okay, go remember, ahead. Which is how populism was beaten in the South, which is the most. It's the most incredible, awful story. Uh, they they it was it was beaten by a racist campaign in North Carolina called the White Supremacy Campaign, and it was uh, violent and it involved you know shooting people and intimidating people, and that's how they beat populism in North Carolina. It was, and by this in North Carolina, they had fused with the local Republican Party, which was a largely, you know, a black, that's where the uh, black voters were, were uh, still loyal to the Republicans back then. And they uh, unleashed this incredible attack on the uh, populace and the Republicans and they, they beat them. And once they did it, uh, once they had beaten them, they disenfranchised black voters to make sure that this never happened again. They took the vote away from black voters and a lot of poor whites. And they did that all across the South, by the way. And that stood until 1964. As uh, That's how they, I mean, that was, that was done in a lot of states in order to stop populism. It's an awful story, but it is well known to history. 
So I want to just say one thing real quick that to, and Sugi needs to get in here and I'm talking too much. Okay, and I I, so am you. I. And I, it's, I am so <laughs> sorry, you guys. So, but listen, the, <laughs> uh, James Traub, who has been on our show and Sugi and I interviewed him, uh, had a New York Times review of the book recently. And he talked about one of his critiques of the book was that populist heroes that you mentioned, like Tom Watson and Ben Tillman, did go on to become racist demagogues that like use race in the way that we imagine in the, the popular imagination that you're pushing back on was populist. Could you sort of respond well, Tom Watson, to that? Tom Watson is the notorious case. And I, I talk about him in the book. Uh, historians are fascinated by Tom Watson because of how, how wrong he went. But I should mention, first of all, Ben Tillman was not actually a populist. He was a Democrat. And he, uh, in fact, I talked about that white supremacy campaign in North Carolina where they, they brought in paramilitaries to intimidate populist voters. Tillman had a hand in that. He was like, this is one of the guys that was crushing populism, was Tillman. He, he was not a populist. But, uh, but uh, uh, Tom Watson was. Uh, Watson was their leader in Georgia and was early on in his career was this inspiring character, uh, wrote this amazing article about how he was reaching out to black voters and we were they were gonna topple the uh, system of the South. And I quote that article uh, in, in, in the book. And then historians are fascinated by him because this is a guy that completely changes. His personality seems to go 180 degrees and he gets uh he gets beaten he doesn't win he he becomes very disappointed he he had been a member of congress and then the uh democrats uh defeated him by various tech you know really illicit techniques and he sort of disappears it becomes very very frustrated and then he reappears as one of the leading racists in the south turns against uh, his former friends in this in this shocking way, and in fact was responsible for a notorious lynch lynching episode. They uh, lynched a, uh, a Jewish guy in 1915, I think it was, and uh, he was single handedly responsible for this. The guy's name was um, Frank, by the way, Leo Frank. No relation to me, but I, I'm I'm still bitter about that. I'm I, I'm really mad about that. But Watson is fascinating because of how wrong he went. But generally speaking, that is not you know you can't sort of dismiss the entire movement because one of its leaders went bad. You know, uh, you, I mean, you can if you really want to. But there are all these other leaders that you could talk about if you want to who stayed true and who were very decent people. Anyhow. It's interesting listening to you talk. I'm thinking about just you know the way the narrative around where you you know you're reminding us that the Democratic Party also was the right the party of racism, and that is a narrative that is entirely shifted. And it's the sort of thing that I feel like I see in Facebook comment threads when um, sometimes when people comment, they're sort of like, "But the Democratic Party is historically the party of racism," and and yet this is sort of like it's actually kind of an ahistorical view. Um, and well, race and immigration has changed a lot. Of course. Yeah, right. I mean, it's like I mean these 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 flips that you're describing, they're yeah. not characteristic of our political landscape now. Now there's sort of like entrenchment, right? Oh, so I, think, I think there's a big flip going on right before our eyes, but it's in slow motion. And that's, uh, I mean, it might happen, it might not, but the, uh, but well, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that some of the time. You had it, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no, you, No, it's fine. I'm, so I'm no, it's fine. I'm, I'm curious about what you have to say about populism, but, but so race and immigration aren't the only areas where populists have been accused of believing something that you say is exactly the opposite of what they believe. And you're also mentioning that contrary to today's version of populism, they were for government regulation, they were pro-free trade, they were far more interested in promoting women. And you know, while we're on the reasons why populism is misperceived, I'm wondering if we can stop and at least discuss and maybe show the audience if we can some of the political- Oh yeah, oh, but can I just mention really awesome. a couple things? Because the, the audience, I, I've discovered, um, people don't really know these things about populism. So yeah, the, on, on immigration, yes, it is true that in their platform, they, they denounced pauper immigration. This is in 1892, um, because on the grounds that it drove down wages, they were trying to reach out to Northern industrial workers. And so they, they, they put that in the platform. And I went and looked and the democratic platform says the same thing. And the Republican platform says the same thing. So to, to single out populists, as the bad guys on this is, is just a weird move. And I also went and looked at the um, autobiography by their leader at the time. It was this guy, a Civil War general from Iowa called uh, James Weaver. And 
he was the one they nominated for president that year. This guy was in favor of completely open immigration on, on you know, entirely humanitarian grounds. So he just ignored the platform and went around the country campaigning for that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just a weird move to say the populists are anti, anti you have to dismiss all these other facts to, to, to get to that, you know, to be able to make that claim. But people want to make that claim so badly. You know, that's what we keep coming back to. So I am really curious to, um, and I'm, I'd like the audience also to see, um, you have these political cartoons in the book oh, and yes. they get they get at some of this from like a different angle. And I think, you know, because we are on Zoom, oh, yeah, there are advantages to Zoom. And so Whitney's gonna- Yes, okay, so da- well, I've got the narrative there so you, you can read the text. Yeah, these are, I found about, about half of these have never been reproduced uh, anywhere as far as I can tell. Uh, this is the, the wonders of the internet is that I was able to do this this research that has not been done for a long time. These so are this from, is populism, you, the big guy with the flame? Yeah, yeah, that's populism. He's wielding the torch of ruin and he's got capital on the run. Don't you love that? <laughs> and he's uh, and, and the, the respectable citizens are like holding their head. They cannot believe what populism is doing to them. And so he's, so- he's wearing the French Revolution liberty cap, you see, labeled anarchy. He's holding a knife labeled murder. <laughs> they're really, I mean, they're, they're kind of extraordinary. They're also like, they're beautifully, I don't know. They're, they're they like on the border, oh of, God, they're no, on the border is... of being illustrations. And so yes. a lot of these cartoons are from Judge. And I wonder if you could just tell the audience what Judge Yeah, so is. Judge and Puck were two competing uh, humor magazines, uh, mainly political humor magazines, and they both hated populism. Well, so there was a third one also called Life, but I didn't do any of their cartoons because they weren't in color. And they all three were very high end, uh, targeted at very wealthy white people. And they were incredibly racist and anti-Semitic and anti-immigrant as, you know, I'm, I'm not reproducing any of their racist cartoons here because they're, uh, they're loathsome. They're absolutely disgusting. But the, the point of all this is, is that anti-populism was far more uh, racist and anti-immigrant and uh, anti-Semitic, I mean, grotesquely anti-Semitic than populism ever was. I mean, much, much, much more so. Well, there's an anti-immigrant cartoon right here. If you, Whitney, if you scroll back up, this one really shocked me when I found it. It depicts Brian, that's William Jennings Brian, as an assassin. And he's dressed in a costume that cartoons of the period attributed to Italian immigrants. And he's a guy from Nebraska. Yeah, yeah. In reality, and they, they've made him. They've made him. Uh, they've made him. In comparison to Lady Liberty, whom he has assassinated, they've made him swarthy. They've made him like incredibly vicious looking. He's wearing a bandolier that says "Anarchy," uh, and his uh, he's supposed to be an Italian immigrant, the assassin. It's just. It's just nuts. But you know, whenever someone says populists were anti-immigrant, I want them to look at this cartoon. I want them to stare at it and, and you know, swallow that. Understand that that was the nature of the debate at the time. You know, it's just it's completely misleading. And here he is as Satan. Isn't this incredible? Um, is, so Brian was a teetotaling, Bible quoting, very pious. Uh, you know, uh, I know because uh, in that later in the scopes trials, he's the one right, who's he's, defending the exactly. The, he's he's a, he's this Bible quoting guy who, he's who not later for, gets in trouble you know, for uh, Darwin. <laughs> right, he attacks the theory of evolution. That's right. That's how his life ended. It's very his career ended. It's very sad. But here he is in 1896. They made him Satan. Unbelievable. By the way, I learned the other day, again, the magic of the internet, I got get these emails from members of the public. Someone was sending me cartoons from England about Thomas Paine, who is kind of a proto-populist, Tom Paine, and they depicted Paine as an ally of Satan also. So that was evidently a, a you know, a, a running theme, uh, you know, people who supported mass democracy, um, you know, universal suffrage, that kind of thing, were friends of Satan. So this is all relevant today because Trump and other supposed populists like Viktor Orban in Hungary and Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil uh, are ascendant, you know, Uh, and you argue that it's wrong to call them populists because their positions are actually opposite the positions of actual populists, as we've been discussing. But I feel like you you're can, after you, something. Look, they're, they're, I, I call them, they're, they're sort of like fake populists. They, they use a lot of the language and everything, but it, you know, they, don't, they don't 
they're, they do nothing. They don't mean anything. They don't have a real mass movement. If you read between the lines, they don't mean it. It's, it's all bullshit. Uh, that's, that's what I think of someone like Donald Trump. Okay, they keep going. Yeah, but I, my, my question is that, uh, yes, that, but also I feel like you're after something more sinister in the book, which is why people want to mischaracterize populism. Like what is the exactly, impulse exactly. behind and, that? And, and it goes on and on and on and on. And I encounter it every day these days. People want to believe that populism is this sinister thing. And so this is, this is one of the big questions in the book. Where the hell does this come from? Why do we, why do we, like we're intelligent people who read books. We could read works of history about populism and realize that this uh, sort of characterization of it is not true. Why do we want to believe this? And I traced that phenomenon to the 1950s and to a historian named Richard Hofstetter. He's, by the way, remember, I don't know if I ever told you this, Whitney, I got a PhD in history once. And um, <laughs> yeah, and I used to really admire Richard Hofstetter. He was the greatest American historian of, uh, in some ways of the 20th century. He was a beautiful writer, a wonderful thinker, uh, you know, could really bring things together that you wouldn't, anyhow, I, I used to love him. But you go back and look, he's the one that began calling populism these names, uh, you know, de describing it in this way. And he was badly refuted. Uh, he wrote a famous book on the subject in 1955 called The Age of Reform. And he was, it was uh, almost within five years was completely refuted, everything he said about populism. But he's the one that said it was um, anti-immigrant and it was anti-Semitic and it was all these other sort of horrible things. It was, you know, mob rule. Um, and his book was immediately refuted by other historians who knew a lot more about populism than he did. But his stereotype um, continued on. And my argument in this book is that he got his stereotype from those you know, uh, those magazines like Judge and Puck and, you know, editorials like the ones that I quote in the book. But what I, what Hofstadter was doing was this larger project. And this is really interesting. In the 1950s, you had this sort of new ruling class that was on the rise, right? These highly educated, college educated professional elite, and they were moving into the big corporations and they were moving into the Pentagon and they were moving into the uh, administrative state in Washington. And all of these people like Daniel Bell, you remember Daniel Bell, they used to write, he was a sociologist, were writing these books about how wonderful this new generation of intellectuals and professionals was and how they were gonna solve all of society's problems. Hofstadter was very much part of this group. They, they called themselves the consensus intellectuals. And their main idea was that they, the intellectuals, could come together in a consensus and solve society's problems. They would deliver rationality. They would deliver reform. They would bring good government. Um, they would, they would, you know, if they got to, they would just sit around some big mahogany table in Washington, D.C., and the, and the intellectuals and the professional class would solve our problems. You didn't need mass movements like populism or like the labor movement. You didn't need that stuff. And but I think that like this, the desire to mischaracterize populism as a, like a way of keeping people out. I mean, the, yes, what See, you're just talking that's, about. Exactly. That's the next step. They need a, they need a word for their opposite of themselves. And, and this is like really clear, I think, especially actually in the chapters on FDR and the Great Depression, even though FDR didn't call himself a populist, you make a really interesting argument that his, you know, his policies were populist and he was attacked by moneyed interest in the same terms that William exactly. Jennings Bryan depicted as Satan had yes. been. And then <laughs> yes. you yes. also have this really remarkable passage where you describe an address that Martin Luther King gave in 65 when he connects the beginning of segregation to the defeat of populism way back yes. in the 1890s. And I wonder if you could make that historical link and read that passage for us. All right, I'll do that. But I wanted to Okay, but we, I wanted to say this. So for this generation in the 50s, populism was their word. It was the word they settled on for the opposite of themselves. Yeah. Populism was the folly of mass movements. And liberalism no longer needed mass movements. All liberalism needed was intellectuals like them. And uh, that was Hofstadter and his friends. And, uh, and then five years, ten, I'm sorry, 10 years after that, you have Martin Luther King. And so this is the, the uh, civil rights movement is an important uh, part of the book. And if you, you can, by the way, you can find this speech on YouTube. It's a very famous speech. This is the speech that King gave at the conclusion of the march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama. And by the way, uh, it happened the week before I was born. Or was it the week I was born? I don't, I don't remember anymore, but it was right around. Anyhow, so King uh, walked up to the state capitol building in Montgomery, Alabama, and gave this extraordinary speech. 
you know, there's the Confederate flag uh, flapping over the <laughs> flapping in the breeze over the Alabama Capitol building. And it, it, you, we remember this speech because at the sort of peroration, the climax of the speech, he recites the words of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. But before he came to that, King gave his this is, uh, again, I'm reading from The People Know. King gave his fellow marchers a short lesson in a different chapter of American history, the origins of racial segregation. Where did this awful system come from? King's answer, it began in part as a stratagem to defeat populism, which had made a shocking bid in the 1890s to bring together poor blacks and poor whites into overwhelming majorities all across the South. These are King's words. The leaders of this movement began awakening the poor white masses and the former Negro slaves to the fact that they were being fleeced by the emerging bourbon interests. Not only that, but they began uniting the Negro and white masses into a voting bloc that threatened to drive the bourbon interests from the command posts of political power in the South. Now, as you might Remember, the powerful didn't want to be driven from the, from the command posts of power. And so to protect themselves, they came up with a way to divide their working class enemies, falling back on the old ruse of white supremacy. To continue with King's speech, they saturated the thinking of the poor white masses with it, thus clouding their minds to the real issue involved in the populist movement. They then directed the placement on the books of the South of laws that made it a crime for Negroes and whites to come together as equals at any level. And that did it. That crippled and eventually destroyed the populist movement of the 19th century. So two, two com one comment here. King is clinically precise. It's so amazing to be reading all of this nonsense about populism. And here's this guy giving this speech. He's exactly right. He nails it. I, I, just, I just love that. Okay, King goes on. It's one of his all-time great images here. The Bourbons, he recounted, took the world and gave the poor white man Jim Crow. And when his wrinkled stomach cried out for the food that his empty pockets could not provide, he ate Jim Crow, a psychological bird that told him that no matter how bad off he was, at least he was a white man better than the black man. And he ate Jim Crow. And this, and then King concluded, this was the story of how populism was squashed. The masters of the South trashed their own society, set human against human in a racist death struggle to keep themselves secure in their exalted place. Do you want me to go on? Because this is one of King's greatest go. passages. They segregated Southern money from the poor whites. They segregated Southern mores from the rich whites. They segregated Southern churches from Christianity. They segregated Southern minds from honest thinking. And they segregated the Negro from everything. That's what happened when the Negro and the white masses of the South threatened to unite and build a great society. And he uses those words deliberately. Remember, this is 1965. A society of justice where none would prey upon the weakness of others. A society of plenty where greed and poverty would be done away. A society of brotherhood where every man would respect the dignity and worth of human personality. I, I love that speech. Um, so he was like an amazing the, man. That's the Holy Grail, you know. I mean, I know it's it is it is fantastic. It is wonderful. He was, that union of 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 black and white working class. James Baldwin talks about it. We've talked about it a lot on this podcast. It is Jesse the Holy Jackson. Grail. It's what it's what Jesse Jackson. I'm so glad you brought him up uh, because he was in many respects a latter day populist. And there is a whole. By the way, um, I try to make this clear in the book, but obviously I I haven't done it. There was a whole generation of neo populists in the 60s and 70s who heard King's call. Okay, so Larry Goodwin, who was, he wrote one of the great historical masterpieces about populism, started out as a civil rights organizer in Texas in the 60s. There's a guy called Jack Newfield, he was a journalist in New York, wrote a book called A Populist Manifesto. Same thing, civil rights movement. Uh, the last U.S. politician on the left to call himself a populist was the senator from Oklahoma called Fred Harris. Nobody wrote, I, I interviewed him for the book. He's still around. Great man. Fred Harris was called for and served on the Kerner Commission. In fact, he's the last surviving member of the Kerner Commission. There is, there is this great idea out there, and we have, we have separated ourselves from it 
and it is it is we've got to we've got to find it again you know we've got to capture that idea again and that's what i i so hope to do that with this book so um that passage is so great i i want to talk a little bit about how all of this applies to the current election in your last book listen liberal um criticized the way Democrats were focused on the managerial class and not the working class. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that that focus has changed so much with the Biden candidacy. And as you yeah. say, it's more appropriate to call Trump a demagogue or just a plain racist than a populist. So who are today's populists and who is speaking for the people? Uh, by the way, you're totally right about that. I don't think the Democrats have changed their ways, but I think they're going to, they have a damn good chance of beating him anyway this fall. I mean, I don't see how you bungle a epidemic like this and come out of it, you'll get reelected. Uh, I feel I that I should I, knock on wood immediately now that you've said that. <laughs> yeah, let's both do that. I just don't see how that's how that's how that's possible. Like, what, 15% unemployment? Guys don't get reelected when they deliver 15% unemployment. But, uh, you know, look, I, I uh, when I was writing the book, it was before Biden had been had sewed up the nomination. And I was, I was one of those guys who was very hopeful about Bernie Sanders. But since then, you know, and I was very depressed for a while after Bernie uh, went down, but I look at the Black Lives Matter movement and you think about their slogan, Black Lives Matter. That is such a populist phrase. You know, it is it is beautiful. And what they are, they're not there yet, right? They're not a full-fledged populist movement. They got the movement part, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. Fantastic, inspiring. What, but I think it's coming. I think that is the next step, that, that this movement will go into economic questions and start talking about the big economic issues as well. I mean, they, I certainly hope they do, and you, that you can see hints of that. Now, you can also see hints of people trying to push it the other way. You know the sort of uh, corporate types trying to grab. You know, you know, you, you've seen this all over the place. Trying to identify themselves with this movement. You know, they don't want it to take that next step, that next obvious step. But I so hope it does. I think it would be fantastic, and I can't wait. I'm very excited about it. Like the corporate, the corporate powers of America are going to quickly try to get everyone signed up for a shoe deal who's on <laughs> involved in Black Lives Matter, so that they don't actually yeah. become a political movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what do they call it? Woke capital, yeah. you know. All right, so we have audience questions, and we're going to start that now. And we've had some coming in on the chat, and you can write in the audience questions in the in the comment section of YouTube if you're watching us there. The first one says, "Loving your book so far." Do you know what's next for you? And until then, what else should we read during this crisis and this populist moment? Looking to support my bookstore and my library, Tom. Ah, uh, well, do support your bookstore and your library. These are essential institutions and I, independent bookstores in this country, I love them. And they have been, I always think about when I was doing the Baffler magazine and we would do these, we would set up our own tours to promote the Baffler. This is back in the 90s. And there were all these independent bookstores all over America that we would work with. And I'd say three quarters of them are gone today. And so we all need to rally around. Uh, but Rainy Day Books is still there. Yes, and they're Rainy Day Books is there. So they, they are so there awesome. And, and they have, by the way, they have autographed copies. The only bookstore in America that has autographed copies of this. Okay, what else should they be reading? I don't know. I'm reading, I, I read so many wonderful books uh, for writing this. There's a whole literature of the 1930s uh, that is forgotten and uh, not read anymore. I, uh, for example, I loved Arthur Schlesinger's biography of, of Roosevelt, this enormous three volume biography. Uh, that was good. Oh, here's one that I just happened to have. Uh, these are essays by Bayard Rustin. Uh, it was a thinker I had never read very deeply. I really enjoyed that. Um, the uh, history, uh, geez, what else have I been? Why don't you answer that, Whitney? What have you been, <laughs> what have you well, been reading Well, I've been reading A Life of Reinvention, which is a biography of Malcolm X. And he, in, in his way, ended up in a sort of populist position after you know, a, a beginning as a, as a sort of black separatist. Um, yeah. and, that I, and Baird Rustin is in that book. He debates Baird Rustin several times because Baird is, has the sort of more integrationist point of view and, and Malcolm X in his early in his career is arguing against him. And then they eventually sort of end up on- Do they ever, did the they ever make up? Yeah, I mean, I'm not at the end of the book yet. So we'll find oh, okay. out. Okay. Can know? I tell you what I've been reading for the coronavirus? Sure. I very early on, I went back to, and then Sugi, I want to hear what you're reading too. 
but very early on, I went out and got, uh, there's an essay that ran in the Washington Post back in the 80s that listed comprehensively all the World War II novels written in by year, like 46, 47, 40, and then, and then ranks them and says, these are the really good ones. And I'd heard of some of them, right? Like The Naked and the Dead, we all know that one. And Catch-22, we all know that. But a bunch of them I had never heard of and never read. And I went out and bought them all, <laughs> you know, secondhand books. Uh, and uh, I've still working on them. Some of them are quite long. Any other, all forgotten, completely forgotten works. What about you, it's, 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 it's so handy that you're in your childhood bedroom with these massive bookshelves behind you. <laughs> I know, I've got no <laughs> shortage here, no shortage of books. <laughs> um, I just got my friend Kiki Petrosino's uh, poetry collection, White Blood in the mail and, and, and a, a very well-reviewed uh, novel called A Burning by Mega Majumdar. Um, I am awaiting the the box that contains uh, Natalie Bacopoulos's Scorpion Fish. Uh, so I've been focusing on on fiction lately, but um, a lot of it. Um, oh, I'm also awaiting several collections of essays, which I think will be interesting to think about in in connection with your book um, and to think about populism in, in connection with race. Um, a lot of essays about um, Asian American identity. Um, of Color by Jess Wender Bolina, uh, Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong. And I think I'm really curious to, I want to go back and look up the Black populace. And Oh I've yeah, been, so there, there is a, there's a book. I was going to give this book a, a shout out. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called, I think it's called In the Lion's Mouth. Um, yes, In the Lion's Mouth, Black Populism in the New South by Omar Omar. Alley. Jeez, I'm sorry, I'm losing my uh, <laughs> this is my, my ability this is to my, pronounce. This is my Omar nonfiction Alley. shelf here, you know, that I have in the backdrop. So, oh, so this I, that's, is my Tom that's all I read. Shelf right here. Oh, it's right fantastic. There, oh, that's that is so refreshing. You're right next to, to Ralph Ellison, uh, yeah. at least his essay. Oh, hey, that's that's fantastic. <laughs> I, I was gonna say, um, oh, now I forget what I was gonna say about 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 books to read. Damn, I've forgotten. Um, well, let's, if it comes back to you, so let us I, know it. you're going to tell him what a great time you had reading my book last night is what you yes, I, did. I, I, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't sleep last night. And so I sat up and read the King of Kings County. Cause I'm actually in Johnson County, which is what Whitney meant by Kings County. And that's, that's where I'm sitting right now. And then I, and then I got, and then the, uh, this morning I went out and got Whitney's bike out of my garage and rode around all the neighborhoods that he mentions in the book. <laughs> I broke my leg because I got hit by a bike, and and so Tom, to you got hit by a car while well, on your bike. bike so I me. borrowed the bike. That was nice. <laughs> they uh, Whitney got hit by a car on his bike, so I borrowed. Hey, the Whitney, bike I heard you got hit by a car. Can I borrow your bike? <laughs> You're not going to be needing that. <laughs> I need right, the exercise. We... I I hurt my knee, and so I can't jog, and I need the exercise. You know. We got another question, Sugi. What do we got? There? Yeah, um, I really like this question. Um, so much of the discourse now is the verbal variation of those melodramatic cartoons. Can you speak to that? Yes, I can. The uh, I uh, those aren't the only cartoons I reproduce in the book. Those are just the only ones where they're out of copyright, and so I felt free to put them up on my website. You can trace those same themes through uh, political cartoons in the 30s. And I have a whole selection of them from the Chicago Tribune, which was this insanely vindictively anti-Roosevelt newspaper at the time. They would, I mean, the, the, the way they attacked Roosevelt is just, it's, it's the stuff of legend. It's, 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 it's mad, you know? Uh, but th this theme, this visual themes, they continue, right? And they continue up to our own day. But this time, here's the funny thing. The uh, Puck and Judge, those magazines were um, very conservative, right? They're pro gold standard, they're pro the ruling elite, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Chicago Tribune, ultra conservative. The Hearst publications that hated Roosevelt, ultra conservative, okay? The people who have, this is the real weird turning point of the book. This is the thing that I really want people to read. Today, that ant, those anti-populist themes are on the center left. Uh, and you see them in magazines like The New Yorker, The Atlantic. Uh, you see them in The New York Times. You see them in uh, European journals. The sa exact same themes, uh, only now done by people who would ordinarily be my ideological friends. So it's, we're in a very strange time. But yes, absolutely, those themes continue. So you, you, you kind of touched on Sanders earlier, but we have a question that asks, how would you fit Bernie Sanders and the progressive movement into populism. So he tried and Bernie is, um, 
uh, one of the things that that liberals don't get is that populism, you know, these great successful moments in the in the liberal tradition in this country required mass movements. So Roosevelt didn't just do all the stuff he did because he was an awesome guy. He was an awesome guy, but he also had behind him this extraordinary mass movement, the labor movement, which was rising up in the 1930s and which like, you know, tripled in size in the course of the decade and was signing people up and going on strike and, you know, really doing stuff all over the place. And then in the 60s, of course, you had the civil rights movement that was standing behind Lyndon Johnson and, and you know, had the potential to grow even larger. Mass movements are the key. And you can't just be a populist meaning, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a, a liberal Democrat and I'm going to promise these great populist things. That's wonderful. But it takes more than that. It takes a mass movement of ordinary people who are brought together, you know, from all different walks of life, all different uh, uh, racial groups who are brought together by common interest. And that's hard to do. That is tricky. And we don't, I mean, Sanders knows that. And Sanders would refer to it as a movement. You know, he's trying to build this movement, our revolution and all that. And uh, that's extremely hard to do. But uh, given this, he tried. He understood that, that problem, unlike every other Democrat out there. They don't care. Can I tell you a, a funny anecdote? Uh, maybe no. I shouldn't. I don't know if I'm allowed to tell it. Fine, go ahead. But then we, have, <laughs> we have more questions. One of the ways I managed to piss off... Uh, my Democratic friends as well. I was at a Democratic gathering. And, oh, let and, me uh, count the ways. <laughs> but I said, it's like, you guys don't support your own mass movements. You know, look at the labor movement. The labor movement is dying on the vine. You know, there, this is, you want to have a strong, you know, liberal tradition in this country. You have to have strong mass movements behind you, movements of ordinary people. And, and they're dying in this country. You got to do something about that. And look at Obama, you know, it, it, there's all these things on the table when he was president mm -hmm. to reinvigorate the labor movement. He didn't do it. They never do it. <laughs> and it's just like, they think they can win without that stuff. And, you know, look, truth be told, they're right. As poly in a two party system, they have a good chance, a 50, 50 chance of winning, but you can't have a real, you know, social democratic movement without that stuff, without, without, you know, a mass movement behind you. So this maybe takes us nicely to um, one of another audience question. In all your years of research with this idea you've been tracing from at least Kansas to the people, have you seen any events similar to the seeming collapse happening now, or would you consider contemporary events unique? Collapse. Uh, I wonder what they mean by, 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 uh, by collapse. I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, this, this things are collapsing in all sorts of different ways, but um, maybe an abdication by the federal government to deal with a massive pandemic. And, and yeah, uh, I, but I was thinking, I was thinking of, the uh, the uh, the the collapse of the Democratic Party, maybe oh. in its in its ideal in an ideological sense, um, the collapse of you know living standards for working people, which is definitely happening, and. Uh, and is getting worse now in the pandemic. Of course, we're seeing this, you know. Yeah, look. I mean, the pandemic is an anti-populist Yeah, disease, it's, it's, it's right? incredibly because destructive. This is all a, the big this companies are going to survive and all the little ones are getting screwed. Yep. And they're getting they're getting bailed out, Whitney. Look at the uh, look at the stock market. You know, it's it's absolutely crazy. Uh, yes, it's a very anti-populist moment that we're living in with this this incredible blowhard on the presidential throne can't do anything it just it makes me mad just to talk about him i'm changing the subject somebody well, said what are your well, future so we, could we, no, could we like maybe could we maybe go back to so Whit, wit's definition of collapse was the federal government abdicating its responsibility i would maybe take it a step farther and say that right they're actually shoring up um people who are already in power um you know turning previously um you know apolitical or just sort of um government grounds into partisan grounds if we talk, if we thought of that as the collapse, um, rather than just the collapse of the Democratic Party, but really maybe like the the collapse of the federal government is sort of how it feels to me. Well, yes, it's. <laughs> so I've written about that a lot. You know, they, right. but how the federal government goes comes under attack in Republican administrations. I I was I had in mind the Reagan and Bush. I haven't written about Trump doing this, but it's all it's obviously this is the wrecking crew, which I think I see on Whitney's shelf. It's uh. 
Trump is obviously just using the same playbook as that the that the Bush people did and the Reagan people before him. The Republicans come in and they go to war against uh, the bureaucracy, and they you know they smash things up, they screw things up, and uh, uh, hopefully the public gets pissed off about it. But what I want to see is us you know, advance beyond these stupid political wars of the last 40 years. They're, they're absolutely idiotic. And I'll tell you something, guys, you know, I'm 55 years old now and I am, maybe this is a good note to end on. One of the things that, that I discovered that defines populism is optimism. It's, it's incredibly optimistic. These guys have this incredible faith in ordinary people and it's a faith that I feel like I used to have, that I really, I really used to have. I really felt it, you know, and I am, uh, I have become so pessimistic as I've grown older. You know, I, I used to think, well, Reagan, that's just, we'll, we'll, we'll reverse all that and we'll get back on course. And now, Jesus, it looks like, you know, what we did in the 1930s, the New Deal, all, that was the outlier. And now we're just getting back to what we were before. We're getting back to the 1890s, <laughs> you know, only with both, both parties have their little role to play. Well, I guess like they did in the 1890s, both parties agree on everything, on the consensus stuff. And it is immensely frustrating to me. And I, my optimism has really taken a beating over the years. <laughs> All right, so we have we do we're at seven thirty, and we're going to stop. We have one last question, and so why don't we do that, and then we'll say goodbye to everyone. Thanks to everyone for being here. Thanks to the Kansas City Public Library and Rainy Day Books for hosting us. If you want to listen to this as a podcast, all you have to do is type "fiction slash non slash fiction" into the search bar of your favorite podcast app, and it will show up. Or you can go to LitHub, where you can find our show page under the LitHub Radio News tab. All right, Tom, last question here. I'm curious, was the senator from Oklahoma, we have an Oklahoman in the audience apparently. Awesome. Uh, I'm curious, was the senator from Oklahoma you mentioned heir to a particular strain of Oklahoma populism? Yeah, of course. Green corn rebellion, question There mark. you go. He, he, he does talk about, he's still around by the way, Fred Harris, and he, he does, hell, I've got his memoirs right here. Uh, okay, I can't. I can't. Half an hour later, Tom. No, it's right there. It's right there. It's right there. Do you see under the my my uh, battleship main that says "Remember the Main"? Right under okay. that is Fred Harris's uh, memoirs. I'm pretty sure he does mention the Green Corner. So people don't know this. Oklahoma was a radical state once upon a time. It was not just populism. A lot of the populists became socialists after populism died out. And in Oklahoma, Oklahoma had like the most socialists of any state in America, which is absolutely crazy. But yes, he was absolutely heir to that, uh, to that tradition. Yes. Tom, thank you very much yeah, for joining me, us. Sugi. This was so much fun. You guys are the best. I love it's talking to you guys. It's really great to have you back with us. Um, we appreciate it. And we'll remind our listeners to pick up the people now. Um, and support Rainy Day Books. And thanks so much to the Kansas City Public Library and Tom.